Welcome to the image processing part of today's conference. In this presentation, we will show you how to accomplish complex objectives using the high-level functions of the Wolfram language. This talk has been prepared by Giulio Alessandrini and myself, Markus van Almsig. According to the subtitle, the talk consists of two parts. First, we will introduce some of the high-level functions in image processing, in particularly the ones new in version 10, and those addressing volume processing and color processing. Next, we will utilize these functions in two non-trivial projects, in the construction of a skin detector and in the segmentation of some magnetic resonance tomography data, a volume set of a knee. Let's start with some machine vision functions new in version 10. Barcode image and barcode recognize allow you to construct and read a large variety of barcode formats. Here we are given a boarding pass. The boarding pass has a barcode, a so-called PDF 417 in its top right corner, which we can detect by asking barcode recognize provide me with a bounding box. This provides me with a bounding box coordinates, which I use in the next command that displays that bounding box. Obviously, we detected the, board, uh, the barcode, and next we read it by asking barcode to recognize to just provide the data. And the data here, obviously, is my name as passenger, the origin and the destination of the travel, the flight number, and so forth. Well, this has been easy. Now, it's just as easy to construct a barcode, but before we go ahead and try to get an upgrade here, I'd like to move on to the next example. Let's start with some machine vision functions new in version 10. Barcode image and barcode recognize allow you to construct and read a large variety of barcode formats. Here we are given a boarding pass. This boarding pass has a so-called PDF 417 barcode in its top right corner. We obtain its position by asking for the bounding box. We can verify that bounding box. And then last but not least, we can decipher the data of that barcode. And here we obtain the information which is provided by given the passenger name, the origin of the travel, the destination, flight number, and so forth. Now before we go on and construct a barcode, uh, I'd like to move on to the next example before I get some funny ideas here, uh, how to get an upgrade and the like. Next, we address the encoding of a barcode. Anything that can be expressed as a string can be encoded as a barcode. And that also holds true for Wolfram language code. In this particular case, we take a one-liner written by Ling Chuan Chen from Beijing, China. This is the code, a little manipulate, which we then place in a toString command that converts it to a string. And that string is then converted to a barcode image of format QR, which essentially is not really a barcode, but rather a 2D code, two-dimensional code, which we here decipher again and convert it into an expression. Here we run the expression, and as you can see, this barcode encodes a little manipulate an interactive program to generate a fractal tree. The most ubiquitous segmentation task in image processing is the separation of foreground and background. And that's what remove background actually does. It takes an image like this one here and a hint like what the foreground or the background property is. In this case, we say the background is a green background and then remove background provides us with an image where the alpha channel basically blends away the background. Such an image can then readily be used in a command like image compose where we place it in front of a different background, like this. The most ubiquitous segmentation command in image processing is the separation of foreground and background. And that's exactly what remove background does. Remove background takes an image and then a second argument that helps us to specify how the background looks like. In this case, we say that the background has a typical green appearance. 
that's all it needs and we are provided here with an image where the background is blended away via an alpha channel and that alpha channel now can be used or that image with the alpha channel can be used in a command like image compose to place it straight in front of another background in this case a galaxy in this particular example we use remove background in a little more sophisticated way here we have an image of flamingos in front of a gray sky we do not specify the color of the sky of the background we simply specify that the background has a uniform structure it only varies up to 10 percent this is sufficient for the segmentation of the birds but just to play it safe and in order to avoid the capture of any small fragments due to noise for example we plug this into a delete small component commands that takes out any kind of small segments and that way we obtain here a fairly clean segmentation of those flamingos now in order to count these flamingos automatically we go ahead and use the morphological component command that component command basically assigns labels to every contingent segment we have in this image so we assign label 1 to this bird label 2 to this bird and so forth and just by extracting the highest label we extract the number of birds and here please verify we have 10 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 birds at hand remove background has done a fairly good job in this last example however one can do better and that's why I'd like to introduce here the grow cut component command again we take the very same image the image of the chameleon but now we do not specify the background by saying that it's blurred but we take a marker image a marker image for the background just giving a few strokes indicating where we find the foreground uh, the background sorry and an image for the background again given by a few markers that would fit exactly here onto the chameleon now this just gives us a rough segmentation idea and now grow cut component provides us with a very detailed very exact and nice segmentation of the above image as you can see here it provides us with a labeled matrix that label matrix i plug into this image here which then generates an alpha channel of the above image and we see the result the result is a delicate segmentation of the chameleon with every detail preserved if you have several images at hand and you'd like to display them at once you're faced with the problem of creating a collage this is a trivial problem if you have images of the same size and format but it becomes harder if the images have a different aspect ratios and different sizes in this case image collage can help image collage basically takes a list of images you can specify a method how to arrange the images several are available you can specify paddings if you like and other options and you can specify the resampling to be applied when images have to be enlarged or reduced in this case we sort images by rows and obtain this result or we sample them by column and we obtain this result image collage cannot only help to display several images at once it can also convey data data like in this case the population of an EU member state here we generate all the EU member states their population and the corresponding flag as you can see population of Austria 8.4 million and the Austrian flag Belgium and so forth and once we have all this data we can basically provide this to image collage and image collage will resize the flag according to the population and we obtain this result as you can see the largest population in the EU is Germany followed by France Italy Britain Great Britain Spain Poland and so forth now we obtain a completely different image if we take the data weighted by the area or the country size in this case the collage looks like this and here you clearly see that countries that were small beforehand like Sweden end up to be rather large 
please let me now address image rotate. Now image rotate is clearly not a high level function, nor is it new to version 10. Nevertheless, it has a few nice options now that clearly show that development is not going on in new functions, but also in old ones. Let's assume a typical problem. You have taken an image on your last trip and you find out that the horizon in that image is not perfectly horizontal. In order to rectify this problem, you have to rotate the image. Here we assume that we know the exact angle and you find out that, well, you get a nice result, but unfortunately you get this padding problem. You have lots of black areas or background areas that don't necessarily look good. Now there are different ways to get rid of this padding or these background areas. You could uh, first pad, but there is no good padding in this case. This would be one, for example, reflected padding. And you clearly see here that you still have some edge here on the top of the image. If you pad here, like in reverse, you basically mirror the horizon across this border. And that's clearly not what you want to do. So if padding or an intelligent padding is not the solution, you're forced to crop. And there are different ways now to crop, to intelligently crop uh, uh, results of image rotate. First, one that has been there before, that is the full cropping, which basically means that you take the image and reduce it to its original size. So you basically crop, you still have left some background part here and here, but nevertheless, it is less. But, well, that's probably not what you want. What you may want is to do a cropping that preserves the uh, aspect ratio of the image, and that's done here by this string, quoting that you'd like to have a same ratio cropping. Clearly, the image is smaller, but it's a perfect image. You don't have these nasty black triangles at the edge, and you get what you want. There's another way to obtain such a result. If you're not interested in preserving the aspect ratio, you may also ask to maximize the area being displayed, and this would give you this particular image, which is the largest rectangle in the rotated image that still fits in there without displaying any background. Let's return to truly high-level functions. And now we address those that can cope with uh, 3D images with volumetric data. So up front, we need some volumetric data. And we have here a data set that displays a vertebra, a segment of a vertebra obtained from a CT image. And you clearly see here the heart bone shell and some trabecular bone structure inside. So that's the data set we work on now. And uh, I will just simply demonstrate some of the high level functions by uh, working on this example. So up front, I'd like to identify the small compartments in this uh, trabecular bone structure that uh, would uh, host the bone marrow. How do I do so? Well, first of all, I have to specify what a compartment, what constitutes a compartment. And here I simply say that, well, a compartment is made up if the bone structure or the density around it is at least 1% higher than the center or the minimum of that compartment. So that's what I specify here. Then next I regularize the data of the bone by performing a Gaussian blur thereby reducing the noise level in the data. And then I perform a min detect. A min detect on the regularized data, where I basically say that I only like to specify those minima that have at least a depth of 1%. Thereby I only detect minima that are within a compartment of a uh, compartment wall that is 1% above the minimum itself. And all these minima that I detect here then functions as seeds in a watershed component uh, algorithm that then basically gives me the complete compartment, which I basically then display here as a uh, image 3D object uh, with a bit encoding. And in order to basically then display the compartment walls, I simply perform a color negate on that volume. So let's see what I obtain. Here, nicely, we can see here the compartments itself. 
and well to make the whole thing look better I can edit the color function which provides me with this color function editor I can increase the opacity or decrease the opacity of the void I can change the color and then apply this to the data and then view this with a different color function and now clearly I can see the compartments that I just segmented much better. Well, as a next step I may be interested in the solid bone material and I segment that again by regularizing the data a bit more than before but I basically do a simple thresholding algorithm by binarizing the data the threshold being 0.25 and by making sure that I delete small components due to noise with the well-known delete small components command. And this basically then would be the area that would constitute the solid bone. Next, I can basically subtract this area from my original data and thereby obtaining the trabecular bone part of that vertebra. I do so by simply taking uh, okay, the bone up there, doing a color negation of the dilated version of the hard bone here, and thereby blending away that area. And thus I obtain here just the trabecular bone structure itself. And unfortunately, I cannot really see the trabecular bone very well in this given volume. So I can apply a rich filter with a given scale of square root of 2 to that trabecular bone I just had, apply a threshold and then do an image adjustment and that gives me this example that much better displays the trabecular bone structure than I have seen it before and I can see very nicely how this little structure basically stabilizes the inside of the bone very much like a static uh, network of little beams and columns. In the previous slide we have shown how to do a segmentation or how to do filter operations on a volume. Here we'd like to address the measurement operation on a volume. Please recall the measurements or the segmentation of compartments that we have done in the previous slide. This was the result. And now we are interested in measuring the volume size of each of these small compartments. We do so by applying morphological components onto this volume. Thus, we obtain a label matrix that labels basically an integer to each voxel in this volume, depending to which compartment that particular voxel belongs. And then thus, once we have that, we can provide the result to component measurements and that command basically goes ahead and counts now or measures the area of each of these segments given by the integer label. Here we go. So here we clearly see area with label 1 constitutes or consists of 21,343 voxels and so forth. Eventually we go ahead, just extract from area all these measurements, sort the measurements, take most of them, basically deleting the last one, which is the largest one, uh, displaying the background volume, and then take the mean. And this gives us the average compartment size, and here the standard deviation in compartment size. And last but not least, the distribution and the display of the distribution of compartment sizes. We now enter a completely different domain of image processing functions, the domain of color processing. Before I start and uh, introduce uh, commands in color processing, I'd like to address the uh, issues that come with the color space. Now, the color space best known to most of you is uh, most likely the RGB color space consisting of a red, green and blue color channel. It's the default color space in Mathematica, 
but it has several intrinsic flaws. First, it has a limited gamut. Gamut is the scope of the RGB color space and it is limited by the linear span of a device dependent red, green and blue signal. This can be nicely seen in the chromaticity plot. The color here is a color that basically you as a human being can uh, perceive. But the RGB color space only covers a small part of that area. It's basically spent by the blue, red and green uh, sensor or uh, primary color of that color space and any linear combination in between. Clearly the gamut is not truly large enough. Secondly, RGB readings are device dependent. Please note that the sensitivity of the red, green and blue sensors in a hardware device determines the color value. Now if the sensors differ either in color or intensity or sensitivity then you obtain different color readings and or rather values and these values don't uh, make up the same color as on a different device. And this can be very nicely seen here in the chromaticity plot of different RGB color spaces. As you may have not known, there are different ones. There are the ordinary one, the standard one, the Adobe one, Apple one. A lot of RGB values, strictly speaking, every hardware device has its own RGB color space. Last but not least, the color metric of the RGB color space does not match the color difference perceived by humans. This means that the color difference in the RGB color space is not given by the Euclidean distance in that space, but it may vary depending where you are. Here, for example, you see that the green color does not change very much. That's why these circles here depicting the metric are fairly large. Whereas if you go here to the red corner, the color change is more dramatic and covering the same distance in the color space, the color difference will be bigger than up here. And this is what I mean by that the color difference is different than the ones perceived by humans. Clearly, RGB colors are not ideal. But there are alternatives. There is the XYZ color space, LAB, LUV, and there are ICC color profile data. Let's start with the XYZ color space. It is a device independent color space defined in terms of standard responses to a power spectrum. It was the first standard quantitative color space and it allows for objective comparison of color. Clearly it is not device independent and furthermore it has a large gamut. But it does not have a metric that adheres to the human perceived distance of color or color difference. For this purpose one had to deform the XY color space and one created the lab color space and the LUV color space. And these are color spaces that are designed to have perceptual uniformity as perceived by human beings. Last but not least, to bridge the gap between device independent color spaces and device dependent ones, we have color profile data or color profiles that provide us with a conversion from a device dependent color data set into an independent color space. Let's exemplify this. Here we import an image, the image of a cone flower. Basically has been taken by a hardware camera, by some digital camera out there and that digital camera provides us with a color profile that exactly prescribes how to convert the X or the RGB data given here into an LAB into a device independent color space. And that's what we do here. We do a transformation and clearly see that the colors changed quite dramatically in this case even. And we see that the true colors were not as radiant as they are depicted up here. To demonstrate the benefits, let me compare color blending and color distance in the RGB color space and then the LAB color space. First here I perform a blending from green to red in the RGB color space and this is the result. You can see that from radiant green to a radiant red I cross through a rather darkish, almost brownish area 
as I go from green to red. Well, I can also depict this in the RGB and in the LAB color space. In the RGB color space, the transition from red to green is this straight line from the purely red color channel to the purely green color channel. Or if I just map this from RGB to LAB, it's this rather awkward curve going from somewhere in the LASB space into darker areas and going back to light green. And last but not least, if I would calculate here the Euclidean distance, it would be the square root of 2, the distance from the uh, red vector, unit vector, to the green unit vector. Now, the same in the LAB color space. Again, I do a color conversion from green to red, but now in LAB. And I obtain this result. Direct comparison shows that here I have a dark area, which clearly I don't have here. I preserve the luminosity very nicely. And I go from green to more yellowish orange to red, which is a much better blend than what I had up here. Again, this shows the same situation now in the RGB and the LAB color space. In the LAB color space, this blending is now a straight line, whereas it is a curve in the RGB space. And as such, the color distance is also slightly larger than it has been previously. Now that we have these great color spaces and those nice color processing tools in Mathematica, let's play with the colors. Here I have a picture taken in St. Petersburg that well, has some colors, but uh, nothing spectacular really. But nevertheless, I'd like to take these colors from uh, the photograph as depicted here in the chromaticity plot, do a cluster analysis, and via this cl cluster analysis, I will find dominant colors in that image. And then I'll take these dominant colors and use them to colorize this particular pattern taken from a textile. First, I take now the pattern, I perform a cluster clustering component segmentation, thereby segmenting the areas with different colors. Then I create here the dominant colors from the photo and use them to map the labels of these segments to these particular colors. So I get these replacement rules. Segment 1 will be replaced by a bluish color, segment 2 by a rather dark color, segment 6 by some kind of beige. Okay, let's do so. And you may, you may be surprised how tasteful the result can be. As a kind of a hint, natural colors always are fairly tasteful. So if you take the colors, the dominant colors from natural photographs, you always have a good chance of achieving nice, tasteful results. There is another method how to impose the color composition of one image onto a second image. In this case, the original image is the a forest in spring, and the reference image here is a tree in fall. And what we try now is the following. Looking at the histogram of the tree in fall, we see this color distribution. We see the dominant colors are in red, less so in green, and very few blue images or image pixels, whereas the first image histogram has a dominance in green, a little bit less so in red, and hardly anything in blue. In order to now get this color impression, my assumption is that the histogram of this image has to resemble the histogram of this image. And this is now achieved by applying a histogram transform interpolation function onto every channel of this image, thus that the histogram here resembles the histogram on this side. Well, these are the functions that can handle it. For the red, blue, and green channel, I have now maps that take an original intensity, like here for blue, let's say of 40%, and then render it as roughly a bit more than 20%. Or in case of uh, red, if I go in with, let's say, 20% of red, the resulting one would be around 50%. Well, these mappings applied to the original image result in the following, result in an image that very much exhibits the colors that were seen in the image taken in the fall. 
Now, all these steps, intermediate steps, are not necessary. This can be done just in one step called histogram transformation. When it's the same result, and just to verify that we have achieved what we were going for, we see here the histogram of the reference, here the histogram of the result, and we see that we have roughly achieved the same histogram, not quite. Some details remain different. Hereby we complete our short selection of high-level uh, functions in image processing and uh, commence with the second part of the talk uh, where we tackle complex objectives. The first objective we have here is the implementation of a skin detector, a skin classifier, that is capable of uh, telling if a pixel in an image belongs to human skin or not. It is quite remarkable that it's possible to detect human skin just based on color. And building a skin detector is a typical machine vision task. Uh, such a task consists typically of two steps. First, the construction of a feature space by extracting certain types of features that are uh, appropriate for the task at hand from an image, constructing a, a space with all these features in it, and then applying a classifier on that space uh, that is well supposed to tell us if an object based on these features is present or not. The feature space in our skin detector, as mentioned, is a three-dimensional lab color space. Other machine vision tasks may require a much higher dimensional feature space consisting of filter results, histograms or alike. In our case, it's just the lab color, it's a three-dimensional feature space and thereby it's very nicely uh, or very easy to display. Now, the whole project is data-driven, so we need data, and we get this data from the machine learning repository uh, given by this link here and uh, this import command. This import, import command will provide us now with data, a long list of colors given by a blue, green, and red value, and a token, a label, either one or two, that tells us if a uh, color is a skin color or not. So basically, by loading now all this data into the data object here, I can go ahead and apply here cases. Cases extracts from the data set all those cases where I have a label 1, converts them into a lab color, and all these colors then are assigned to the skin value. Furthermore, we do the same for all colors that belong not to the skin, but to other objects in the image. Again, we extract those and convert them into lab colors. And last but not least, just to get an impression of what we are looking at, I create here two chromaticity plots, one for the skin color and one for the other color samples. And as you can see here on the left hand side, we see the skin colors they're nicely focused, come in different luminosities, but roughly with the same color distribution. And here are all the other colors found in the images at hand. Apparently there seems to be a clear-cut separation between skin colors and non-skin colors. And that's what we utilize now in the next step. We will build a classifier that will just select those areas in the color space and label points in that color space area as skin colors. As mentioned, now in the second step we have to build a classifier that takes the samples in the color space, in our feature space, and makes a prediction if that particular color sample actually is a skin color or not. We have seen or have heard about classifiers or the construction of classifiers in a previous talk in this conference, so this is straightforward. First, I have to create some sample points to construct a, a classifier. This is simply done by taking now the skin colors, mapping them to true, and uh, taking all the other colors and mapping them to false, combining them into one set, and then basically taking random samples out of that set as a training set. So that's what's done here. And then in this key, command, I use classify, 
I fuel in the training set and I propose here a support vector machine as an appropriate classifier. Doing so, I now like to visualize if the resulting classifier function actually does what I'd assume it to do. And uh, in order to visualize that, I first calculate here an array of probabilities, the probability of having found, uh, having found uh, a skin pixel or skin color or not. And uh, simply simple now the skin function for LAB and I render the probability if it's true or not, which gives me a value between 0 and 1. And I sample it for B ranging from minus 1 to 1, A ranging from minus 1 to 1, and L ranging from 0 to 1. So basically covering all of LAB space. And this will give me basically an array of probabilities. And this array of probabilities I now visualize here via a list contour plot um, and then superimpose on the chromaticity plot. And thereby I see if my classifier nicely uh, embraces all the uh, skin colors in my chromaticity plot or if it doesn't. Well, this looks quite promising. Here I have drawn three ACRI probability surfaces, one for 10% probability that skin 50% and 90% probability. And you can see that pretty much all of the skin colors are nicely hooked into this bag, to this classifier bag, uh, embracing all the skin colors that I'm looking for. So this looks promising. Let's move on and test the classifier. Let's test our newly generated skin detector. Well, up front, I take my originally original set of skin color and non-skin color samples uh, by just taking another random sample from the large set of samples that I have here. And then I fuel them here with a skin color function into a classifier measurement. The classifier measurement basically will apply the skin function onto the sample set and generate here a confusion matrix plot that gives me an idea how well the performance is. Well, it looks pretty good. First of all, most classifications seem to work out correctly. The false uh, colors or the, the non-skin colors are mapped to false. The skin colors are mostly mapped to true. Only a few confusions are uh, do occur. Here in 27 cases, uh, the skin, sorry, the non-skin color has been classified as skin and only in two cases has the uh, actual class, the actual skin being, uh, been predicted as uh, not skin. So this is uh, promising and now uh, let's uh, proceed ahead and apply the skin function to an actual, actual image uh, that we convert into LAB space of a human face. And as you can see, the probability of skin is now depicted by bright colors or by white. Basically, most of the skin in the face has been recognized as such. There are basically no uh, true negatives. However, there are quite a few false positives because quite a bit of the hair appears to have skin color as well. So some of the hair up here is classified as a skin, which of course is not quite correct. But it's quite amazing, nevertheless, that skin of quite different complexion here and here is detected. This is now the second phase and you can see even with a completely different skin color, the skin detector works quite reliably. Okay, let's tackle our second complex objective the dissection of a knee. Well, segmentation of medical image data can be as tricky as segmenting the real thing that is dissecting real tissue. Nevertheless, to quantify and to measure the properties of a volume component or a volume component, segmentation is a necessary first step. And to, segmenting, to segment here the bone tissue in a magnetic resonance tomography volume, we first have to apply a clustering algorithm that gives us a, ch a rough segmentation. And that rough segmentation then we take as markers in a 
final segmentation, a grow cut algorithm that will give us the, uh, the final result. Okay, let's just uh, try and uh, go ahead. Here's the volume that we imported. You can see uh, the empty space, the skin, the muscle tissue, the bone. Uh, you can see it from below and above. Uh, that's the initial data set. Now the initial data set has some noise in it and to overcome that noise we uh, apply a median filter to make it more homogeneous uh, and that median filter will take uh, most of the noise out. And then in the second step we apply a clustering algorithm. Basically we cluster uh, voxels with uh, uh, similar uh, intensity and thereby we obtain three clusters and as you will see these clusters uh, are assigned to A, empty space, B, muscle tissue, and C, all the rest, that is the bone tissue, the skin tissue, and the fat tissue. Well, now to extract just the tissue part that we need, we have to figure out what label has been assigned to that particular tissue. And we do so by performing a component measurement on these segments, and we basically derive the mean intensity of every segment. And then we sort by these mean intensities, and that segment that has the highest intensity has probably the label, uh, is a label for the bone itself. So now that we have the label for the bone, we can use that label and ex uh, extract the component that has exactly that label and plug that into an image 3D volume, and thereby we obtain this result, a mask or a volume depicting skin, fat tissue, and bone. Now, to tell these th three tissue types apart, there's one trick. And there's one decisive or distinctive property, and that is the bone tissue is rather massive. It has a big thickness, whereas all the other tissue types come in thin layers. Here, the fat comes in thin layers and the skin as well. So what we can do is we can perform an erosion and an erosion of roughly four will take away all the fat and skin tissue and only leave the bone, and that's all we need. We just need a marker of the bone tissue. We don't need the bone segmentation as such, because that will be done in a uh, subsequent grow cut uh, algorithm. So that's our marker for the bone. It uh, nicely gives here the marker for both uh, bone segments above and below the knee. And now we just need a marker for the surrounding tissue. And that we simply get by dilating this uh, initial marker sufficiently that we are well outside the bone area and then take the perimeter. And that perimeter is then our initializing marker for the outside tissue. Okay, so much for the first segmentation step. Now we go into the second. Well, now that we have everything in place, that we have the marker volumes, the remaining uh, grow cut algorithm is straightforward. What we have to provide now to the grow cut component command is the volume itself, the marker volume for the bone, the marker volume for the tissue that is not the bone, and this will give us then the segmentation. This segmentation we convert into a volume here, and then that volume, in order to regularize the boundary, uh, because there is some noise left, we send through them uh, through a median filter of radius 1, and this gives us then a volume, a mask that uh, denotes the segmentation of bone tissue in the image. Well, here we have the result, and this essentially is a kind of a mask. A mask that uh, basically denotes the area or the volume that consists of bone tissue. We can use this mask basically as an alpha channel for the real data, which will give us a better visualization. So this looks like the actual bone being taken out of the volume that we have provided originally. And you can see that every detail has been segmented fairly well. A non-trivial task, if you have challenged that before, you'll know. Well, at the end of the day, Essentially, you would like to do measurements, and we just do here uh, four very simple measurements. We take these segments and tell them apart by morphological components, basically providing a segment here and a segment here, 
And then we perform the measurements via component measurements on the components and the knee and we ask you for the shape, the area, the median and the standard deviation. And this gives us then the result here, the femur giving me here a number of uh, roughly half a million voxels with a median intensity of almost 0.7 and a deviation of 0.1 roughly. And then the same for the lower bone here, the volume here, the slightly lesser density and the variation thereof. This concludes the introduction to the new image processing features in uh, version 10. I hope you learned something. I hope you got ideas for what to do yourself. It has been a pleasure. Thanks for listening and uh, goodbye.